Here's to those who give a damn. The ones who question the status quo and say we can do better. You don't wait to be invited to the table. You set your own table and bring people together. You believe great ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. No matter who you voted for, what you believe, the color of your skin, or who you love. Some might say you're a dreamer, but we think you're brave. Because those who are brave enough to start a conversation that matters are the ones who co-create a better future for us all. It's time to come together. Yeah, I'll never forget that night. I was still playing with the 49ers, and my wife walks up after the game. They told me that my cousin Corey had been killed. Corey broke down on the side of the road, and a plainclothes police officer pulled up. Then this guy starts screaming. All you hear from there is three shots. Why? Why is my son gone today? Why? He would give you his shirt. He would be cold just to keep you warm. This officer was in plain clothes. Corey had no way of knowing who he was. There's just some things that are bigger than football. And I felt like starting a players coalition and affecting change in this country was one of those things. We focused on police community relations, education and economic advancement, and criminal justice reform. Had it not been for the work that we do, Corey's death would have been in vain. The best way to inspire change is to be it. Welcome to our 2020 King Holiday Signature Event, Beloved Community Talks. Thank you for joining us for these courageous conversations as we explore systemic racism and the actions required to end it. We invite you to share this live stream event on your social media platforms. Our moderator for tonight's courageous conversations, Jamil Smith, senior writer, Rolling Stone Magazine. Our first conversation, Understanding Systemic Racism and Intersectionality. We will take an in-depth look on how racism is interwoven in the very fabric of our nation and understand the root causes of systemic racism. Our conversationalists for this segment include Dina Hayes Green, co-founder and managing director, Racial Equality Institute, LLC, and Dr. Jacqueline Badalora, St. Xavier University, author, Birth of a White Nation, The Invention of White People and Its Relevance. Our second conversation, A Decade of Change and Disruption, will demonstrate how to use your voice and influence to amplify social issues and dismantle systems that perpetuate injustice. Our guest, 
Takeo Spikes, creator behind the mask, retired NFL linebacker, and Quan Bolden, co-founder, Players Coalition, retired NFL player. Our final conversation, the fierce urgency of now, with Dr. Bernice A. King, CEO, The King Center, takes us beyond the courageous conversation into active participation in bridging the racial divide. This beloved Community Talks is made possible by our sponsors, Procter & Gamble and the NFL. Together, we can bridge the racial divide to build Dr. King's dream of the beloved community. Join the King Center and our partner, Civic Dinners, to learn how to host your own beloved Community Talks in your very own communities. Camille Smith, and I'm a senior writer with Rolling Stone magazine, and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator tonight as we continue some much-needed conversations that we believe that will help our nation bridge and build together. Now, this evening, we will explore the origins and impacts of systemic racism in America, and then move to examining the role that each of us can play in disrupting and changing conditions that keep us from actualizing Dr. King's vision for the beloved community. And without further ado, uh, let me first introduce our, uh, our first conversation guests. Uh, number one would be Dr. Jackie Batalora. Thanks, Jamil. Thank Great you. To be here. And last but not least, Dina Hayes Green. Uh, so, Dina, I'm going to start with you. Okay. In his book, Why We Can't Wait, Dr. King writes quote, For too long, the depth of racism in America, American life, has been underestimated. The surgery to extract it, it is, it is necessarily complex and detailed. As a beginning, it is important to x-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. Now, we have a lot of medical metaphors there, but I want to ask you, it only makes sense that we cannot root out this kind of institutional hatred and inequality without truly knowing how deep the roots go. Why, in your view, does it matter so much that we conduct this surgery that Dr. King is talking about? I think without that, we don't know why we're where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, two of my um, mentors, uh, Michael Bird and Dr. Linda Clayton, laid out a chronology of the history of race in this country, and they have it broken down into these chronological periods. From 1619 to 1865, that's 246 years, 62% of our experience in the United States has been under chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. So we're not just oppressing and um, brutalizing black people the genocide against Native Americans, but we're building a nation. We're establishing every major institution in this country, its orientations, its uh, epistemology, all of its ways of being. Then we have another 100 years of Jim Crow from 19, 1865 to 1965, 25% of our experience. So out of 400 years, we have spent 346 years, 87% of our experience in a whites-only nation. And so it is, it is impossible then to uproot that without that examination, and not just the history of the oppression of people of color, but what was going on in this nation at the time. But Jackie, so many people tell us to just get over it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, they say, well, you know, this is such, these so many advances have happened. Uh, why aren't we moving on? And in that light, I want to you know, ask you, how does systemic racism perpetuate white advantage? I mean, if this is something that you examined in your book. Absolutely. Well, first of all, the only people that could make such a statement that get over it, it's in the past, <laughs> um, is ov obviously pretty revealing in and of itself. And, and it reveals a problem that is, um, it is right in front of us. It's in, it's in our school districts. It's in the texts that our kids are given, the, the um, the educational content that our children are held accountable for, 
Um, and it is a version of history that whitewashes the stats that you just shared with us and, and um, erases the um, routine advantages that white people are conferred and have been conferred. And if we don't see that as white people, um, we can ask that question, right? Mm -hmm. And so if our education system is continuing to give us this very distorted version of history, um, then, then we miss most of U.S. history. But, you know, your book is called Birth of a White Nation. And so in that respect, there are a lot of uh, people who are simply taught that this nation, you know, is for them, or, or they are taught uh, simply that, you know, racial disadvantages um, essentially are, are, are minimized compared to what they actually are. Can you tell me a little bit about how institutional education uh, plays a role in this? Well, it does by um, giving, like I said, a version of events that right. erases um, the structural advantages. One, one of the ones I like to use in my classrooms regular, because it's just an easy one to grab onto, um, when people want to say, well, you know, my, par my, my family didn't get any of that. We didn't hold slaves. Right. And so I find this one just a really good one. So as a matter of founding law, our founders, the first Congress of this country, determined that in order to naturalize a U.S. citizen, one had to be white. So above loving freedom, more important than the gifts, the education, the insights, the talents that you possess, they put whiteness first. Mm. For more than 150 years, you had to be white to naturalize in this country. And so that's just a wonderful example, I think, of structural advantage mm -hmm. conferred to white people, whether you want it or not, whether you asked for it or not, irrelevant. You got it. We get all kinds of structural advantages because they're baked in. That is systemic racism. I think, you know, we're taught often also that racism looks like or sounds like a certain thing. It sounds like a racial slur. It looks like a particular gesture. Dr. King stated, you know, that we miss the broader dimensions of the evil of racism when we ignore, quote, our nation was born in genocide when we embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Can we talk a little bit about how, you know, that historic racism, that particular racism plays into this? Yes, and I think that's one of the things that keeps cross-racial movements from getting off the ground. Um, you know, this um, you know, s design, this concept, this construct of race and racism evolved. And um, you know, as people come to this country, encounter people that are in their way, the plan for Native Americans largely was genocide. Mm -hmm. um, African Americans are providing, pro providing free labor. And so as Jacqueline was talking about, you know, in 1790, our first census says in order to be a citizen, you have to be white. So black and white were the sort of racial identities on the mm -hmm. census of the United States from 1790 to around 1840 or 1850. And so black and white anchor this race construct in the United States. Other people, as they come to this country or are brought to this country, they enter that field, you know, that race construct in relationship to black and white, not independent of it. And if we don't understand how we've been inserted, then it pits us against each other. Mm -hmm. Because to survive, you need to get as close to white as possible and as far away from black. And so when we play into that, it key, you know, um, <clears throat> we begin to compete with each other. Uh, people begin to distance themselves from race, period. Even the immigration movement isn't centering race as the barrier. Because if you start talking about race in this country, then you align yourself with black people who are having collectively the worst outcome in every system and institution in the United States. Mm. Today. Today. And, but it, it also within that, we have to look at the evolving definition of whiteness. Absolutely. And so can you Indeed. tell yeah, both of you, uh, um, Jackie, I'll start with you on that. Sure. Can, can you talk a little bit about how that has expanded over the years and why? Yeah, well, if, if I may, I'd like to touch on sort of the inventive moment. Um, okay. okay, so <laughs> colonial North America, um, prior to 1681, if you look in the legal record, there is not a single reference to a group of people called white people, not one. Um, people, were, people who became white were referenced as um, English and other freeborns, Christians, right. 
um, and the like, but you will not find a white person. And so the question becomes, well, why? Why would you go about inventing an entirely new group of humanity, right? Lawmakers are like the rest of us, and they don't tend to exert energy in things that require effort unless it's to serve a purpose. And so to divide the 99%, because we had, we had shown the force that we can be when we are united through Bacon's Rebellion, um, to divide the 99% from each other, we invented white people. And so we deployed all of these um, English indentured servants and uh, poor British, um, largely British people, um, made them white to unite them and place them over and above persons of African descent. And so we divided the 99% from each other. So the first assertion of whiteness in law in colonial North America was um, a version of whiteness, of white people for the first time, that meant nothing more than divide and dominate. Mm -hmm. And then we see different versions of whiteness throughout um, different moments in US history, where we have, um, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, when our country virtually doubled in size, and yesterday some people were Mexicans living in Mexico, and the next day there are Mexicans living in the US and they didn't move. And right. they were white by federal law and not white by state and local law. And then you have Irish Catholics um, who came in the midst of the t uh, potato famine who were white by federal law, white by state law, but not white at the local level. And then, one other example, <laughs> we have large numbers of Chinese men who came to pan for gold and build the most dangerous sections of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, who were not white by virtue of federal law, um, not white by virtue of state law, and not white um, at the local level. So those are just um, some manifestations of, of non-whiteness and how whiteness interacts with different groups. Um, again, when you get into the details of the story to divide and dominate. Dana, how do we see that manifesting in policy today? Well, I think the un unmarking of white, so as you know, Jackie says, we've built a nation on whiteness and we made it invisible. Mm -hmm. So as I've been exploring all of our societies and associations and our curriculums and our methodologies and our approaches and all of our systems and institutions, they came from the experiences of a group of people who've come to be called white. And when you make it invisible, then it makes it very difficult for white people to see that every day they're having a racial experience. You know, mm -hmm. the American Medical Association, you have to be white to be a member. The American Bar Association is restricted to members of the white race. Um, I was talking to one of uh, the brilliant um, young interns that are helping out with this event um, from a historically black college and university. And, um, and he referred to the white university as a PWI, which it triggers me right away. So, you know, so what is a PWI? It's a predominantly white institution. Right. Well, that's ahistorical. It's a historically white university. See, predominantly white leaves out the history of racial exclusion, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? right? And so, so, th so our young people are not getting the information. Historically, white says you couldn't come here if you weren't white. Mm -hmm. And Sorry. so then white kids get to see that their skin got them something. Their identity gets them a lot because then when you have the Black Student Union on a historically white college and university campus, white kids say things like, well, if we went and created our own organizations, that'd be unacceptable. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, we I like went to one of those universities and I heard a lot of that. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, in, with regards, we're talking a lot about identity right now, and of course, on the flip side of that, of course, is, the, is a word that a lot of people consider to be too academic, and that is intersectionality. Now, that's defined as a framework for understanding how aspects of one's social and political identities might combine to create unique modes of discrimination. So you have a this mode of this, this you know, part of identity that's being discriminated against, this part of your identity that's being discriminated against, and they intertwine. Why must we understand this framework and incorporate it into our normal conversations to not only fully grasp how racism works in America, but also to fully and effectively strategize against it? 
I'll, you know, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand what that really means. I think we've distorted that so much. I think it's an incredibly um, important reality that we have to understand the other isms. Um, but if we're not careful, then we'll, we'll explore and examine intersectionality through another ism called escapism, mm -hmm. right? So right. this is how I take the off-ramp to race, and I can right. talk about gender or identity or religion or uh, status and, and those kinds of things. So I think it's critically important to understand how race intersects with all of those things, not independent realities. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, we see, you know, we have, of course, gender being one of those identities. We have, you know, sexual identity, a number of different ways that people People can be discriminated against, Jackie. How and why is race so you know, important still in our, in our lives? It is the principal organizing factor in this country's history and remains so today. Mm -hmm. In I Have a Dream and in the World House chapter of his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, Dr. King mentioned the fierce urgency of now. Uh, so what is one lesson that cultivators of, and those perhaps unknowingly complicit in systemic racism, like we were talking about before, what is it that they must learn, uh, and Jackie, I'll start with you on this, with the fierce urgency of now to earnestly begin to eradicate systemic racism in America? Um, yeah, there are two areas where I think the urgency of now um, gets revealed, and those are in healthcare, and law enforcement. And the reason for that is because they leave bodies behind, black and brown <laughs> bodies behind, mm -hmm. right? And so the act of, let's say, ima imagine this scene. Um, that you're, there's a restaurant, there's um, a white woman has her purse right here, and a younger African-American man is walking past, she grabs her purse and puts it up here, okay? This act. Now, when you get into what's motivating that act and the assumptions held, um, those are the same set of assumptions that get manifest in using a gun and experiencing fear um, through law enforcement um, and that results in medical actors not treating the person in front of them as a fully human being deserving of their care. Mm. And so... Um, now is about lives. The urgency of now um, is for people of color a matter of life and death, and for white people it is a matter of um, finding our humanity again. Mm. Yeah. Dina, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, if we don't act now. We are in a period of regression. Mm -hmm. And while we've made enormous progress, I think Manny Marable said, you know, my, my you know, worst nightmare has come true. We've made a lot of progress and nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. Our outcomes are wider now than they were at the time that Dr. King and others faced brutal terror so that we could have access so barriers would be removed. Um, Dr. Sandy Darity and Dr. Keith Robinson uh, put out a, a stunning and um, disturbing report, what we get wrong about the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And so home ownership won't close it. Uh, right. Higher education won't close it. All those things are incredibly important. But they are inadequate responses to these systemic inequities. Mm -hmm. The material consequences of those 346 years are glacial. Right. They're glacial. If we do not understand the nature of that, then the systems gap will be recreated by those things. Right. And I think it's life and death for white people because yeah. you can't lower the standards in a system for one group and think another group can operate optimally. Right. You know, while black women's babies are dying at two and a half to three times the rate of white women, white women in the United States babies are dying at rates greater than that of white women in other countries. Yeah. And so, um, so, there, so we have our gap here, but we're really sliding off the international stage when it comes to education and healthcare and overall well-being. So I think, I think the moral imperative isn't enough for, for white people. Mm -hmm. I think that white people need to know your lives are at stake in this as well. But Jackie, we see you know, maternal mortality is not the only area in which you know, essentially white life has become more and more endangered in this country. I mean, we've seen it. 
you know, then become the base of the drug problem with yeah. the opioid crisis. Right. Uh, and all of a sudden, of course, that changes you know, legal strategies all of a sudden. Right. Imagine that. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how much more needs to happen for essentially these white communities to get it? Or is racism or the, the, the preservation of that unearned advantage so appealing that they're willing to forgo essentially you know, their own longevity? Yeah. Well, I think that there's <laughs> enough evidence to suggest that the, the love of hate has, has been so significant and foundational um, for so many white people that they're willing to give up years of their lives to hold on to it. And that, yeah, so. Yeah, because I'm, we see areas, um, and, you know, not to pick on particular geographic areas at all, but you know, we see areas of the country that are, you know, essentially we hear all the time the phrase is voting against their own interests. Right. Um, we, you know, we've heard that phrase you know, thrown at black folks a lot. Uh, we've heard it thrown at women in particular yeah. a lot but not white people as a group. Um, I'm trying to understand, you know, especially with the rise of white nationalism, uh, you know, in this last few years, what is it going to take for white people, and I'll direct this at both of you, to, have, to understand better that they are indeed having a racial experience every day in this country? I think more of these conversations, I think an examination of whiteness and what it means, um, you know, as, as Jackie was saying, um, when did people become white? You know, mm -hmm. because every one, when, when was whiteness created and then when did b people become white? Because um, so many Americans believe that um, there are biological differences between us and they're not. And so <laughs> we don't understand that this is this false construct, but it was right. institutionalized and emboldened and empowered in such a way that now we don't need the maliciousness that we needed anymore. Right. And then we have um, our diversity movement, which was important, but th that becomes the evidence then that see race isn't an issue, you know, because we've right. got this person and we've got that person. And so, um, so I think it's, it's really, really important to also understand white people aren't doing well. You know, we have twice as many poor white people on welfare in this country than we do African Americans or Hispanic Latinx people. Black people and Hispanic Latinx people are disproportionately poor. But when you're talking about on welfare, and just talking about meeting the federal poverty threshold, almost twice as many poor white people. Right. So poor white people aren't doing well. The thing is, is that they're not doing bad because they're white, but they are doing bad because of racism. Yes. And we That's have great. to get clear about that and we have to get fluent with that. How do we yeah. convey that to white people so that they can see that they've been used as a wedge uh, between other oppressed people and, and uh, white people who are doing really well and they get just a little something for it. In this respect, Jackie, I mean, that we see some politicians uh, primarily focusing on the class argument, perhaps in, a, in an effort to gain the attention of, 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 of electorates like that. Right. How effective is that as an argument uh, either politically or you know, in terms of uh, strategizing for, for actual change? Well, I think it's, um, we have to, we have to talk about class, but we can never just talk about class. Mm -hmm. uh, Dina has all referred to numerous statistics that are, they're not about class. It is about race. You, you strip away the um, class divides at, these school, at our school boards where we're looking at um, how our students are performing and how they are experiencing their education, and you find clear delineation, and it's along excuse me, along race lines. Right. Um, so, uh, so, that, so then talking about only class from a political stage um, is, it, it reveals blinders, and perhaps they're intentional blinders because there's an assumption about we the people and how we will respond to um, saying the word race. I mean, you think about Obama's <laughs> presidency and the care that man had to take with how he spoke, mm -hmm. um, and, and I know that many uh, white people who engage in or, or try to engage in anti-racist work, like we are in front of large numbers of white people, and when we just say the word race, or people white. are feeling attacked. You mean <laughs> you're, you're calling me a racist, race. what do you mean? And yeah. people are feeling attacked. White yeah. privilege, and oh my God. 
What white privilege are you talking that. about? I'm poor. So, I, so I want to say that yeah. to say clearly, we the people do have strong responses, yeah. and so there's a political cost, uh, but there's also a political gain. Yeah, I believe by the honesty, the integrity mm -hmm. of of a leader who can speak truth. There's yeah. got to still be something valuable about that to us. That obviously the the modes for leadership are different now. Uh, and a large part of, you know, the large reason why is technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we are communicating in a lot of different ways, and frankly, propaganda gets issued in a lot of different ways. Um, they have a lot more convenient avenues these days. Dina, how, how does that play into strategizing to combat this problem? Well, I think it could be a very powerful tool, but I think we have to learn first. We've ha we have a lot of conversations without education and information. Right. And then it becomes our experience, our opinion. You know, a lot of the sort of open mic, just come and weigh in, I think lends to the confusion. Uh, my minister said something after attending a workshop about our history. He said, you know, an organized lie is more powerful than a disorganized truth. Mm -hmm. And if we don't organize the truth and then say that together, then we might end up working in, in ways that counter each other. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, if, if some of our you know, people in our community, especially in the African-American community, see racism and racism as bigotry and, and the N-word, and other people think it's about our curriculum and how people make decisions about uh, aggressive healthcare decisions, mm -hmm. then we're not even talking about the same thing. And, and, we're, and we're black. Right. So we need to get on the same page. We need to invest that time in understanding and studying this and then use technology as a way to communicate with what Dr. Jim Johnson says, mind-numbing consistency. Mm -hmm. That's right. Jackie, um, you know, so often, though, you know, we get distracted from that conversation um, because we're wrapped in conversations about, well, did this person get called a racist or so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, how has that dynamic shifted towards that, you know, towards sort of pr prioritizing white feelings over black outcomes? Oh, yeah. Well, it does prioritize white feelings over black outcomes. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time, every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's exactly what it does. I have no, there is no, I can't twist that some other way. It, it, <laughs> that is what it is. That's the truth. Yeah. Um, and it's happening all over the place. In fact, you know, before we came on, we were talking about how we try to approach different groups when we're facing, you know, controversial um, things that occurred in the community. And we talked about how we are so careful with the language that we use, but we're really clear with the, the truth of the impact, the truth of the history that shaped it, but we try not to use terminology that's just going to shut people off on the front end. So I, I think that's okay to be careful with the terminology, right? Because I, I can articulate that white people are conferred um, unfair advantage from, from the very first laws passed at this nation up through this present moment, right? Because the, the, those whose interests and perspectives shape all of our laws is that of heterosexual Christian white men. Mm -hmm. Right, and and that's just the norm of law, and um, and so I can say that, and mm -hmm. that's a truth, right? Yes. Or I could say it that white supremacy is built in our laws, and then people don't listen to me. So, <laughs> right? So, but but I'm going to say the first, right? I'm right. not going to leave that out. It, that, right. So that's the point. Like to try to use terminology that's not going to shut that off. I tell my students sometimes you want to shut it off and. Just know that that's what you're doing, right? <laughs> but if we want to dig in and try to work together um, and engage in a conversation, then let then do that. You know, I, I can I can do that in a way that's going to root us in history and that's going to challenge us. And you know, I don't have to call you a racist to do it, right? Even if we are, because the structures that we live in make us that way. Last thing, very quickly, how essential is it that we have anti-racist leaders. And I mean that in a very specific, specifically defined way. I mean, Ibram X. Kendi has you know, come out with his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. So if you're not under understanding what I'm talking about, there's a manual now. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I would highly recommend that you read that book. But 
Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, why it's essential very quickly that we have anti-racist leaders, Dina? Well, I think an anti-racist leader brings a sort of um, race analysis into the work that they do. I mean, I, I, I'm on the school board in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. I've been on the school board for 18 years. And without this anti-racist framework, I wouldn't even ask the right questions. I wouldn't know to, to ask the questions to get to the information that dispels some of the initiatives and programs that we're doing that have been ineffective, that have maintained a racial gap for decades. And so I think it's critically important yeah. that our leaders bring that sort of anti-racist, structural racism yeah. lens, critical race theorist lens to the work that we do because we're, we're making decisions and we're influencing policy. Indeed. I think it's really useful as well because it, it keeps us from getting sidetracked and helps you be really focused mm -hmm. on what are the results uh, of that policy? Mm -hmm. you know, what are they? And, and if we know they're, they're really racist because they're unequal along race lines, that's racist. So let's consider other policies that are not. And so it, it, I, I find it a really useful way to, to help us not to go off on different tangents and to really stay focused on the goal, which is finally becoming a people, a nation that is anti-racist. Can you even imagine it? Yes, I can imagine a lot. <laughs> so yes, I can. And I think as long as we can continue to imagine it and, and try to imagine it, then that's, uh, that's the first step towards the goal. Jackie, Dina, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank Jamil, you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to remind everyone here and watching online that uh, at the end of each conversation uh, we, we want to invite uh, all of you to join us in taking a listen to others who are in our watch party uh, for their thoughts and without further ado we're going to go right to that watch party. Hey Charles can you take it away? I, one thing struck me when I, uh, when I heard the conversation I, I've always heard people tell me get over it and not only does it make me mad, but it also makes me think that you don't see me and you don't recognize my history. I wonder when you heard some of this wonderful discussion, uh, Elaine, what, what, what struck you when you heard it? Yeah, there were a couple things that stood out to me. I think the first one uh, was about whiteness being invisible mm -hmm. and wiping that away from it and then bringing in the conversation about intersectionality because I do think it's so easy for us, um, like for women, to grasp on to, hey, we're feminists and we're going to band together or we're people with disabilities and we're going to fight for that. But you don't peel back the layers and, and figure out that there's race behind all of that. And that undergirds all of the things that are becoming those isms. So I do think that we need to have a collective conversation about it. But it struck me as, um, you know, the reminder not to forget that race is part of that conversation about intersectionality. Good. I think as a white person in this conversation, um, you ended on race is a reality. And I think Jackie's point of there is a discomfort of even saying the word race yeah. or racism. And if we can't get past starting, I mean, it's the elephant in the room, right? If we can't use those words... We're not going to make progress. And I think um, a lot of times you'll have a discussion and they're like, well, I'm not racist. And to, to your opening comments, I think if we can get people to engage on a level of not being concerned about whether someone's calling them racist or not mm -hmm. and getting them to an anti-racist, that's, that's the bridge, that the, the gap I think we're in that needs to be crossed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing that struck me that, that Dean had mentioned was 87% of, of our history, the written history in this country, um, and you think about what a hurdle that is to climb uh, and just how much it's become institutionalized. And when you think about it in that frame of reference that you're talking about the vast majority of, of history in this country, uh, it's not really that surprising that, that we're still having such a hard time overcoming it. But uh, to your point, to me, I mean, I think it really is how do you, how do you take a stance of becoming an, an anti-racist and acknowledging our privilege and, and really moving forward from there in a way that's, that's more inclusive for everyone. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, you know, I think um, what was really interesting, again, what Dina was saying about, you know, white um, being invisible and also what's in our education system today and how that's also kind of being erased and it's, it's being whitewashed in that sense. And even as an Asian American, right, you see racism in different levels even within the Asian community. And I think there's a self-awareness that we all need to bring to the table 
to, to have that discussion about being an anti-racist, we all have to put it on the table and say, hey, what are our views and how are we looking at things? Mm -hmm. And are we trying to swipe things under the table and just make it like, oh, it's not racist? And I think that's really key, especially for youth and kids, that this recognition happens earlier. You see, it's different with elders and adults, right? That conversation has to happen, but the adults teach the kids. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that these concepts really get put into the, to the children as well. Randall? Yeah. So I think we're quickly losing a demographic in this society, particularly young black males. Uh, I coach and mentor, have been for years, young black males, and they're starting to become really disenfranchised with a system that they're realizing is set up for them to fail. They're undereducated, underhoused, undercared for in the healthcare system, at the same time being over policed and over criminalized. They're starting to realize it earlier and earlier and earlier, and uh, we're starting to lose them as a society. Yeah, what do you guys think about that comment about the love of hate? Yeah. How do we get over that, that concept? Because it's in both, both demographics in some respects. Any thoughts? Yeah. I think that's a tough one. I mean, uh, there's, it, it's, it's the love of hate that you're not wanting to give away from it. I think we have to go back to the first word in that it's the love. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we need to start there. Everyone, every human has that desire for love, um, of being, of feeling self-worth. And I think if we start there, we can try to sort of move that needle, but um, it's, it's, it's gonna be tough. And I think, look, um, love of love, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. so why not have that? I mean, I think a lot of it also has to do with ego. You know, are we willing to accept, you know, hate comes from having ego. If you look at the core tenets of what hate is, it's ego, I'm better than you, or I'm better than this, or this is my point of view. Love is about compassion, about respecting the other point of view. And I think that's what we really need to start looking at is, how do you have the love of love, right? I mean, it's, it's a great quote from Dr. King, right? I mean, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. With one word, how do we, how do we drive out? Drive the love of hate. Um, courage. One word. I don't have one word, but I have a, a couple of words. Uh, we're teaching it. We're passing it from one generation to the next. Love and hate are strong emotions, and I believe they're being taught from one generation to the next. So I only have one word, but that's one phrase I like to talk. One word. I, I think empathy. Empathy is, is really the one that I would think about. And it's not, it's empathetic love if you can walk in someone else's shoes. Hey, Jamil, uh, we have a lot of notes here. We have a great discussion. It was a great discussion we just had. Uh, we are, we're going to continue our discussion. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to you for the uh, next conversation. Thank you. conversation. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, pivot into our second uh, talk. Uh, with me, I have uh, in, former uh, NFL veterans and current activists, Anquan Bolden and Takeo Spice. So gentlemen, before we get started, I wanted you to take a, take a minute to tell the crowd uh, and those watching online, what is it exactly you're doing uh, in your retirement? Uh, myself is uh, just fighting for equality uh, mm -hmm. right here in Atlanta. Uh, we're always involved. We work together across the country, but right here in Atlanta, the things that we're focusing on is voter registration. That's very big. And uh, the thing that, I, that, that comes to mind is that a lot of people just don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And so we take it upon ourselves, myself in particular, right here servicing in Atlanta, is to make sure that I educate the common person. When you educate somebody, you empower them, and after they feel empowered, now they have the ability to go ahead and lead. And so we do that by writing op-eds. Mm -hmm. I do that by doing PSAs. All of that to make sure everybody's informed, and then once you inform people, it allows them to be a leader in their own sector. Understood. Inquan, how about yourself? Same exact thing. Um, I helped co-found the, the Players Coalition, which is both current and former NFL players uh, who are trying to effectuate change in this country um, through criminal justice reform, through police community relations, and education as well. And like he said, one of the main things we have to do is educate people. Um, because there's a lot that people don't know, 
mm -hmm. that are on the books. And I think just saying it out loud makes people think twice. All right. I want to ask how you specifically use your influence as former athletes uh, to disrupt unjust systems that, that you see that are out here and also to challenge systemic racism, including in ways that may get you labeled as agitators or whatnot. <laughs> uh, Anquan, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think Takiyo talked about it a little bit. You know, for us, it's doing PSAs, doing op-eds, it's hosting town halls, it's educating people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's no secret we're all here because we live in a, an unfair society. And I think for us as athletes, I take it as a responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I look at it as a privilege, but I also take a step back and... and so for myself, being an athlete, we're afforded certain privileges. Right. So I know we, we always look on the outside, but we have the opportunity to create change probably more than anybody. People, people like athletes, entertainers, for whatever, for whatever reason, like we connect with them. Right. So like it's irresponsible for, for me not to take on that, that challenge. And I think about it, like I said, I, I'm afforded certain privileges. I can remember being in high school, and because I was an athlete, I was able to get away with certain things. I remember um, going to school, driving to school, and they had this, you know, how they said these speed traps or whatever. Right. Um, so there was a couple of teachers who actually got ticketed. And where I'm from, it's predominantly black, 95% black, whatever. So but some of the teachers got caught up in this little this little sting, this little, uh, oh, okay. right. So here I come behind them and I'm over the speed limit as well in the school zone and I get pulled over, but because I was the athlete, I got off. Yeah. And now the, the teachers come to my classroom was like, <laughs> they thought I got a ticket, <laughs> but they come to the classroom was like, Hey, we need to do something about this, da 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 or whatever. And I'm like, uh, I didn't get a ticket, though. Right. But then I realized the prejudice of an athlete, yeah. the advantage of being an athlete. I'm afforded some opportunities that others aren't afforded. Mm -hmm. So why not use that for the good? What are your thoughts, are your thoughts on that? Um, as far as? As far as the, your experience with having, you know, enjoying that advantage and and feeling like, you know, it's a particular spot that athletes are afforded, and how does that help you do your work? I ride on the same back as far as what Anquan talked about. I remember, I think this happened in Charlottesville, and just sitting there and thinking, it's certain things that I won't say that I'm immune to, mm. but it's certain things because of what I've been afforded, what I've been blessed with, is that I'm not going to necessarily see from a high percentage. And I remember going to bed that night and I laid my head on that pillow. <laughs> and I was like, you're sitting here, you have the opportunity to put your head down, get great sleep. But well, something inside of me was pulling at me saying, well, you need to do more. You need to do more because there's plenty of people who are not necessarily edu educated in those platforms but they don't even have a platform. Right. What are you going to do now since the good Lord has blessed me with the ability to go out? And so, you know, when I look at it, yes, I do agree because I feel like uh, we have a fiduciary responsibility mm. as athletes, as entertainers, as anybody who have a platform, we have that obligation to turn back around and not only help lead some of the younger ones that's coming after us, but also to teach and educate. I want to ask both of you, and I'll start with you, Anquan. In the next decade, how do you see your work helping to curtail racism in the criminal, quote, justice system in America? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, hopefully we make an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when, when, you, when you get into this line of work, initially, like, you're so... Like, you, you think you can change the world. <laughs> and I still believe that I can. Right, right. 
But change doesn't happen that fast. I remember going to Congress and talking to senators and, and congressmen and having them agree with us. And the, in, in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, if you agree, why not just pass a law that says what you feel? But it's not that simple. No. So for us, we have to be consistent. Yeah. We have to stay at it. We can't. And, you know, it was talked about in the last segment. You know, one of the one of the things that happens is and one of the things I'm afraid of is we see progress. And then people get happy and then we regress. Mm -hmm. Like because you like you even see it in the NFL, like, you know, for at one point you had black coaches getting hired. Right. You know, you had black GMs getting hired. And then everybody's happy. And then you turn around five, six years later, and then it's like, well, where did everybody go? Right. Yeah. And it's well, because we got happy with, you know, the change that did happen, that did take place, but we forgot to continue to fight. People forget that it was 13 years ago that we had two black coaches coaching against one another in the Super Bowl. We had Mike Tomlin getting hired. We had Jerry Reese getting hired as the GM of the Giants. He went on to win Super Bowls. And yet, none of that forced any change, any systemic change. Why do you think that is, in, you know, to go in, in the NFL? Now, I, I have my own thoughts on this, but, you know, given your experience, why do you think that, uh, that culture persists? Uh, I think the, coach, the culture persists. I mean, you look who runs the league. Exactly. Yeah. They don't look like you and I. They're not brown and black people, not even a few. You know, it goes back to the Rooney rule. You know, we talk about in 2003, the Rooney Rule was, in pl it, it was put in place s similar to affirmative action, but the Rooney Rule, because it's a private entity, the NFL, you're not going to get the, I guess, the penalties from the affirmative action. But when it was installed in 2003, we had three minorities as head coaches. Mm -hmm. Now we look back, what, poof over 15 years later, nice and we're still in the same position. Right. Three coaches. You know, so it's not by accident why we are here or why we're in that position. It's because the lack of or the negligence of not giving the opportunity to people who are qualified that look like you and I. And, I, and I'll say this. Um, I don't think we hold enough positions of power. Mm -hmm. Right. So like and you talk about that being in the NFL. And for me, it's it's, it's not even the fact of having a, a black face in power. Right. It's having the right heart mm -hmm. because I've seen some communities with black faces in power and they've dev devastated the community. Yeah. So we have to be careful about just getting a black face in positions of power and make sure we get the right heart. there. Right. And to that point, I think that, you know, diversity has been presented as this, uh, this panacea, this, this you know, end-all, be-all solution for racial animus or, or racial injustice. What the, it does play a role, though. What, what, what part do you feel that exclusion and lack of it, uh, diversity play in injustice? And, and how can we focus on those things while also realizing that diversity and inclusion by themselves don't equal justice. Okay, I'll let you, well, whomever wants to start. Yeah, that's fine. The, you talked about diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine, he preaches this all the time. You know, diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. Mm. And, you know, when you talk about systemic oppression, as the ladies, they were up here on the panel before us. Um, it's, it bothers me because, just to give you a quick story of how it all ties together, I was in Southwest Atlanta, mm -hmm. and uh, I adopted a school over there. And we talk about black and brown people being punished, <clears throat> being locked up for things. This little kid, six years old, he said, can you help me cut my hamburger? I wish my dad was here to cut it. And I was like, oh, that's fine. 
I, he said, cut the hamburger into six pieces. And I was like, all right, mm -hmm. I'll do that for you. And after I cut it up, he said, these two are for me, and can you wrap yeah. the other ones up? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I remember covering the, uh, I did a story about San Francisco uh, City High School District, and I was covering their city championship. And it was supposed to be a fun piece for when I was during my days at NFL Films. And I ended up having a really stark conversation with one of the coaches about how he has to feed his players. You know, that his players come to practice malnourished uh, because either they don't have food at home or, you know, the, the, the school lunches are insufficient. And yet we see now, uh, you know, federal government trying to walk back the nutrition guidelines. How vital are those little things in terms of the overall strategy to fight racial injustice? I think it's very vital. Um, but that's why I think the inclusion part is important. Mm -hmm. So I think about it like this. So you think about the majority of the people that are in positions of power in positions to create change. They don't deal with a lot of the stuff that we deal with. Mm -hmm. So, and I go back to the NFL, right? Yeah. So you have all of the owners of billionaires. You have 32 billionaires, right? right? But they have no idea or no clue where I come from. They don't deal with the things that I deal with on a daily basis. Right. Their families don't deal with the same things that my family deal with. So it's hard for them to connect with me. So if I go to one of them and I, I tell them about something that's, that's affecting me, mm -hmm. they have no context. These people don't even go to the airport. Right. Like, no, seriously. No, no. About that, though, it's, like, it's a real thing. So it's, it's, it's tough to kind of try to change the mindset of somebody who has no context of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like they don't deal, they don't deal, they don't go to a drive through right. They don't deal with what we deal with on a, on a daily basis. So for us to, to go to them and, and to think they have a clue as to what we're talking about, I mean, that's absurd. Right. And to think that, you know, that they, that, you know, to say that they don't even have experience with those kinds of daily issues, let alone the fear that comes with being in this body. Right. No matter how much you're paid, no matter what, what uniform you're wearing. And so, to get, you know, how do then we bridge that gap? Do we say, look, you know, we just don't look to these people for help and we have to look elsewhere? How does, how does, how, is there any way to reach these people? I, I think there is a way. I mean, and I think we, we've saw it, um, especially in the Players Coalition. Conversation can never stop. Mm -hmm. And you have to try to bring them along to experience what you are experiencing. So take, for example, in, um, in Massachusetts, we got this, this bill passed, Raise the Age. Mm -hmm. And Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, he was real instrumental in helping us. So we told him how kids as young as seven and eight, nine years old were being tried in the court of law. So for things that we used to get in trouble for in school, we might get in-school suspension, a, refer a referral or something like that. Right. These kids are actually getting prosecuted in the court of law. Mm. And initially having that conversation with him, he told us no way. Mm. So we do a court watch hearing and we take him along with us. Mm. So he actually sees it for himself and now tears are rolling down his face. Right because he's hit with the reality of what we deal with on a daily basis. So I do think there's a, a way to, to get across to them, mm -hmm. but you have to be persistent. And I won't say just because, you know, they don't deal with what we, we deal with, they're animals. I don't, I don't believe that. Of course. And but you have to make it personal to them. And to add on to that, uh, his experience is going back and forth with the NFL owner. Mm -hmm. I think we all have to take some responsibility and know and understand. I have people in my direct circles who don't look like me. They are white. 
And because they have the same experience as some of these NFL owners, maybe not flying on their own plane, but they just know they come from areas or just have not seen it or have not partook in it. And so what I constantly do is, because it's, I've grown, and it used to offend me a lot when I hear them say something as ignorant or something as stupid as I hear them say, Mm -hmm. But I take that opportunity and I want to encourage everybody else to say, let me put it to you in this perspective. Let me show you, you know, how to be, have some empathy towards somebody. Right. I'm not asking you to feel sorry, but I want you to understand what this person is going through. And I take that time as a teaching moment. And mm -hmm. I've reached more people that way versus then just coming off top and yelling at them or cursing them out. Right. You'll never affect somebody that way. Yeah. yeah. But you're, we're in the business of, of not, not just, you know, affecting policy change, but changing hearts and minds, yes? <laughs> that is the most difficult thing to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just being honest, like to change somebody's heart or to change somebody's mind is, it's a difficult task. Yeah. But I don't think it's one that we can shy away from. Um, I, I think... If a person has a soul, I think they can be reached. Yeah. Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail is, a, you know, one of the featured things that we usually hear on this day. Um, and in that letter, written in response to a clergyman who disagreed with Dr. King's presence in Birmingham and with his actions toward ending discrimination there, he wrote the following, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, uh, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. When, you know, we see how protests manifest in the, in the current day and how you all have used your power um, within you know, the public sphere to, to affect change. How then can we, I guess, maybe, are, 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 what successful strategies have you employed, I should say, to help people beyond the league, you know, understand what, why what you're doing is important and why this needs to be addressed? I think first thing first, it goes back to educating people, your peers, in your circle. Mm -hmm. uh, once you educate, you empower after somebody feels empowered, it gives them the ability to lead in some type of capacity. Uh, to me, I think main thing, first thing first, is when you really want to try to affect change, you have to continue to harp and show people by what you do on a consistent basis, holding these elected officials accountable. Mm. Reminding people that they're not untouchable. We voted them in, or maybe you didn't vote him in, but if you want it to change, now you have the opportunity to vote him again. So just reminding people from that simple aspect, this is democracy where we live. Right. And if you don't believe in it, we'll continue seeing the same hamster running on the wheel like we have right now. I want to ask you specifically with regard to your voter suppression work, how kind of responsiveness have, have you gotten within Georgia? Because we know the kind of problems that have existed here in this state. It's a fight. Mm -hmm. It's a daily fight. And I keep going back to this, and I, I, don't, I do not want to be cliche, but you have to inform people and let them know because most people will, some people who haven't voted, they either have one of two approaches. Ain't nothing going to change. My vote don't count. My vote doesn't count. <laughs> uh, the other one is, <laughs> well, I'll get around to it. I'll wait. To, uh, I'll, I said I'm going to wait to do it tomorrow. I'm going to go and make sure I'm registered to vote. And my message is, if you wait to start to tomorrow, you will never start. Mm -hmm. at, at some point, when are we going to let our forefathers rest? <laughs> when are we going to take the initiatives? Every, gener every generation, we drop the ball somewhere. But I truly believe awareness is the beginning of change. And if I can make you aware, now we have an opportunity 
at a fair fight. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, with that whole voters thing, I think we have to teach us the importance of it. Mm. Like, no matter who you are, if you have the ability to vote, you have power. Right. For so long, they've told, them, they've told us our vote doesn't matter. Our vote doesn't count. Well, that's what they want you to think. If your vote didn't matter, if your vote didn't count, they wouldn't fight so hard to keep you from voting. <laughs> Amen to that. You make a really good point there. I think at the end of the day, maybe the other side understands how effective these strategies can be almost more so than the people who would be helped most by them. Most definitely. I mean, in the state of Florida alone, right, we got Amendment 4 passed, which restored voting rights to 1.4 million people. Right. Think about that. And, like, it affected me because it was formerly convicted felons. Right. My brother has never voted. He's 42, 43. Mm. He got a felony charge before he was able to vote. Right. But then you see that Republicans in that state legislature have, uh, you know, not just Republicans, but mostly it seems like driven by them have uh, tried to, I guess, enforce a particular um, provision within the law. Can you talk a little bit more Most about definitely. that? So, so prior to uh, uh, Amendment 4 being passed, there was a panel. Uh, Flor I think Florida was only one of three states that had this. So like if you were a formally convicted felon, um, you got out, you did your time, paid your restitutions, whatever it is, you, you off probation, your voting rights what, wasn't automatically restored. Mm -hmm. You had to go before a panel. And the governor was a part of that panel, and they gave you a yay or a nay if you get your voting rights back. Right. Right? So you've had people who were out of jail 10 years. I'm talking business owners, had never gotten into trouble anymore, you know, living a successful life. Right. But never restored their voting rights. So you punishing people twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They did their time in jail. They, you know, they paid their debt to society. Right. But now you're still prohibiting them from taking part in our democratic process. So with getting with getting Amendment 4 passed, now people voting rights are automatically restored to them, mm -hmm. which makes a world of a difference when you're talking about a state like Florida and you add 1.4 million votes to it, how that could swing a state. Even the last gubernatorial election. Yes, indeed. Gentlemen, I wish we could continue uh, talking. This has been a great conversation, but unfortunately, uh, we got to move on. Uh, Anquan Bolden, Takeo Spikes, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Back to our watch party. Uh, Charles, what do you guys have? Uh, we got to move on. Uh, Anquan Bolden, Takeo Spikes, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that these athletes, in some respects, have privilege that others don't have, but they also have the burden that others don't have as well because of their position. Tamika, you've been in the uh, sports industry for over 20 years. What, what have you seen in terms of dealing with athletes and how they respond to some of these issues? Well, first, I want to say I'm a huge fan of the two guys. Uh, that were on stage. Um, Anquan has been working with underprivileged children for his whole career. Takia, um, you know, not this past election, election before, I saw photos of him walking elderly into uh, the polls on his personal time. And, you know, the challenge for me, um, people don't understand the schedule these guys live. Uh, for six months of the year, they have one day off a week. So they work six out of seven days. And on that seventh day, which is Tuesday, they're typically out in the community giving back. So um, as a society, I think it's, it, it bothers me that so much of the burden is put on them. And when I look at them, they're doing incredible work. But then when I look at each of us, we all have platforms and we all have circles. And um, as a kid, I was taught that I was the only Jesus that some people would ever meet. Hmm. And I think that view of, I'm the only person that will be able to reach certain people. And if I don't reach them, there's no one else who can. And so instead of putting all the pressure on Anquan or Takio and all the great work that they're doing, 
I think we need to look at ourselves and what are we doing with the platforms that each of us have. But Randall, let me ask you, haven't we looked to our athletes as kind of those heroes who could lead us that way? If you think about Ali, you think of Arthur Ashe, even you think of what um, LeBron, Le LeBron is doing. That seems to be what our community kind of looks for in terms of those people. We, we do and we have, but I think to Tamika's point, I think um, we also have to search ourselves and say, <clears throat> where can we make, where can we have impact? I know for myself as fire chief in this great city, I, I live this juxtaposition justice, justice every day. Yeah. I serve citizens who live in homes where the setback is so great it's hard to see the house from the street. But yet I also serve citizens who may have a family of six living in a one bedroom. To make it even worse, I step over people who have mm. slept outside all night just to get in my off, just to get to my building. So I have to search myself as fire chief and say, how can I make a difference? Mm. And not depend so much on these athletes who are clearly trying to make a difference in their sphere of influence. Mm. Yeah, look, I agree. I think, you know, we need to start looking at putting the human in humanity, right, at the end of the day. And so this is a community issue that we have to look at. It's mm -hmm. not certain individuals, it's all of us. And to what you were saying earlier before, what are we doing in our respective circles? How are we having the conversations? You know, uh, Anquan mentioned earlier that, you know, we, we, we have these conversations, we make success, and we, we see change, and we're happy with it, then all of a sudden we kind of flatten out and and we forget about it and we look 15 years later and the, the progress isn't where it needs to be. So I think that's what we need to look at that don't you know, sit on your laurels and say, yeah, we, we got a couple wins only to be where we're supposed to be in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. We need to keep pushing forward and that conversation comes from each and every one of us in our circles. The ownership's on us as, as community people in our, in, our, in, our, in our towns. Yeah, I mean, something I heard recently was that we all have an opportunity every moment of every day to, to be a force for good in the world. And regardless of whether we have millions of people watching us on a regular basis, or if we're just kind of the average Joe who, who has a couple of friends, the question is what do you do with those opportunities and how do you express them? Even if it's something as simple as, uh, as we talk about race, inviting people of other races to, to dine with you, to sit around the table, and to have these, these very candid discussions. Uh, and, and, Every one of us can, can have a profound impact, even if it's just in the life of one person, mm -hmm. and that compounds dramatically. Yeah, and I think the comment about um, awareness is just the beginning of understanding. I think that you know lends itself to the com what you just said about inviting people to the table. But also, I think we also have to remember that there's a difference between charity and change. And I think when we get to a certain status, when we get to a certain level, we're comfortable with that charity. We're comfortable with sending a case of water or giving clothes to somebody, but that isn't the real change when you when you can really affect that. And I think that goes for athletes as leaders, as people in the community. We all have to remember there's a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and how, how are you providing access to marginalized right. communities if you are in a position where you actually can provide that access? That's right. but, but I don't want us to skirt over the issue, though. I think we should encourage our athletes to be voices. Absolutely, yeah. Because one of the things that we've heard in this community is that some people don't want our athletes to be voices they just want them to play but the reality is is that we have so many people who may not listen to us or we may not have spheres with but they have a platform if they don't use that platform then then we're missing an opportunity like earlier today the uh, keynote speaker said where are the prophets I'm asking the question where are the Ali's out there where are the Arthur Ashes out there who are pushing the envelope and moving the conversation forward and maybe putting it in circles that that we can't have access to Look, Charles, I would say every individual has a gift. Mm -hmm. Everyone sitting out in that audience today, you have a gift. It's how you use that gift to solve the problem. Yeah. And that's I think right. that's what we need to look at. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, sometimes we get really overwhelmed. I think we've had discussions before about the whole and the systemic issues. And um, we, we don't make progress because we get so just bogged down in where to start. And I think the, the quote of do for one what you wish you could do for yeah, all, yeah. I think if you take that mindset to this, this cause, whether it's do for one issue, do for one person, have one conversation, I think progress, you know, the, the fear of starting is our biggest hurdle a lot of times. And, and it's not all the other things we come up with in our heads. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I love how the athletes today, a lot of them are taking the steps to, yeah. you know, whether it's on the, on the court or on the field um, to show that. But again, we all have to come together and do our part because 
systemic racism and all of the systems that combine, we all have a part in that. I mean, we all have to continue to break it. So maybe they have the platform to say it. We have to help them with the work. I like that. I like we, really, that. we really do because, yes, the professional athletes do have a platform, a huge platform, but all of these kids are not born with size, speed, and talent, That's but right. they can still make it in this world. That's right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, think about the conversation <laughs> that we all had a couple months ago about see better and do better, yeah. and the more that, that the children in our communities are aware that there are opportunities <coughs> out there, uh, even if they are not a great athlete, for them to succeed and really make a profound impact in the world, then, then the better off we'll, we'll all be. And it's just a question of how do, you, how do you take advantage of those and how do you demonstrate to those same kids that they have these opportunities. They, they also raise another point about the fact that they are playing, but most of the time the owners don't mm -hmm. look like them. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think the players could do? If we, if we had an opportunity to talk to players, what would we tell them and encourage them to do in terms of their ownership? Not just to hire more coaches, but how to change the dynamic, change the conversation that's going on in most of these leagues. So look, I, I think it, it all goes back to um, being honest with one another, right? I, I don't think we should ha create a perception of, well, these people have to be here for this reason, or they have to be here, or that person has to be here. Because it goes back to what Anquan said, make sure you have the right heart, not just the mm, face. Yes. Like that. And I think when we start using the chess piece to put faces where they, we think they should be, we miss the heart piece. And I think the area we need to focus on is where are the right hearts in the right place. Yeah, and, he, and he yeah. did make a good point. Just yeah. because people look like them, right. don't mean that they have the right heart. Exactly. And so we don't want to have tokenism. We want to have actual change. Absolutely. But, but I also wouldn't um, put all that pressure on the person that might look like them. Because, you know, we talk about even challenges within our city, right? We've, we've had, the mayor has been black for a number of years, but there's still problems in place that even the, the systemic issues and the systematic things that are there, like one person can't change that. And that's where I think the collective is really important. Even if you have a, one leader, sometimes the, the dynamic is such that it's still gonna take a group. Yeah, but I think their point was, is that just because someone looks like them, they do have a responsibility. And if they right. abdicate that responsibility by getting something for themselves, they miss out. Yes, yeah, right. And right. within our community, that is something that is taught that you have a responsibility not for your own, but you have a responsibility for the collective community. Because right. you people, might be the only one. That's correct. And if you mess it up, you mess it up for a whole lot of people. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And I think the other key point that was brought up earlier too um, is look at it from the other person's point of view. So when you're having dialogue and conversations, so it's one thing to say, okay, this is what, you know, like you're standing on behalf of a community saying this is what we need to do. But what is it from the other side that you need to understand? You know, a lot of times it's difficult to deal with racism when someone's coming at you. Mm -hmm. But if you try to understand their point of view, just, you don't have to agree. You don't, I'm not saying you, you say, okay, this is allowable, but if you understand where they're coming from, then you can have a dialogue. And not, not a dialogue where there's really two monologues where people are just going at it with right. each other, but a true a, a dialogue of what is this person coming from? What are they trying to say? Look at it from the other lens. Um, I think that's what Takio had said earlier, and I think that's where we start having real conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, to that, to that point, uh, and it's been brought up a couple times in these conversations about fear and just the power mm -hmm. of fear. Yeah. And how do you get past that initial emotional reaction, which we know activates so much more quickly than if you're being thoughtful about it? And, uh, and just how do you push through it and, and train yourself effectively to, to take the right reaction and, and, and to be as empathetic as you can in those situations? Hey, yeah. great, great discussion, guys. Yeah. But I think we have to get back. Uh, Jamil is actually with our friend. I'm Dr. Bernice King, so we want to send it back to you. And we'll continue our discussion about what's going on here in America. Thank you. Speak with uh, the daughters of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Wanna... <laughs> now, that being said, they have names, so we're going to introduce them. <laughs> Professor, author, and activist, Ilyasa Shabazz. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And of course, uh, we have none other than Reverend Dr. Bernice King. So Dr. King, I'll start with you on this. I just want to get you know, both of your uh, reactions to the conversations that we've been having. Any particular thoughts that come to mind? Well, I think the, the most important thing that I heard over and over again tonight is about educating and enlightening 
um, people. I have a saying that it's irresponsible to leave people in their hate, in their anger, in their fear, in their ignorance, that mm. we have an obligation um, to elevate people's thinking uh, because people are born into environments and circumstance. You know, we all come to this earth as innocent little children and we don't choose the environment or circumstance that we are raised in. And so when people become adults, we just assume you should know better. And that's not always the case because if I have a certain orientation until I meet and come in contact with someone who can show me another way, who can open my eyes, that change will never happen. That's why it's dangerous, as uh, my, my two brothers said, that we just fuss at people, <laughs> assuming they ought to know better. Yes, in our orientation, we know better, and we project that off onto other people. But our responsibility in knowing better, because I was telling uh, my executive assistant just a minute ago, that there's also a such thing as having the privilege of being a child of light mm. and not a child of darkness. And so we have to handle that responsibility as well, uh, being privileged to be a person in the light and enlightened like that. Indeed, indeed. Professor, what are your thoughts? Um, so I thought, think it's absolutely fantastic that we're having the discussion. Mm -hmm. And all of the panelists were extremely enlightening. Um, my father said, if you put a knife in my back 12 inches or 9 inches and you pull it out 6 inches, there's still 3 inches in my back. Yeah. And we haven't even pulled the knife all the way out, let alone have the dialogue. Because there have been so many hundreds of years of this psychological trauma mm -hmm. and no accountability for it. And so if we're going to uh, resolve these ongoing issues of living in fear and living terrorized and, and having this disadvantage and our children being the, you know, living as they are, um, it is extremely important that we are having the conversation and that we are having strategies and that someone will be accountable for these ongoing acts. I think it's absolutely extremely important. Indeed. And in that light, uh, Dr. King, this evening we've learned about the King Center's call for others to host 1,000 courageous conversations. What impact or changes in communities are you hoping to see as a result of those conversations? Well, let me say this. There, there's something my, my father said uh, that um, I think we need to hear and why we are having these conversations. Um, and that is that there's nothing in this world more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Yeah. <laughs> sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Um, <laughs> if a person is ignorant, they don't know. Maybe they should know because with all that we have in this world, they should avail themselves uh, to find out, but if I live in privileged circumstances, mm -hmm. that's what I know, mm -hmm. that's what I'm comfortable with, and that's what I'm going to stick with. So we felt that it was necessary to take people out of that sincere ignorance and that conscientious <laughs> stupidity. Those are the people who know, but they choose to be stupid about it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to, you know, protect <laughs> that privilege, and they do know better. Um, and so these conversations are designed to get people out of the fear zone um, and get them connected so that they can begin to have those conversations um, and understand each other. Um, a lot of times we talk at each other and not talk with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our courageous conversations are really about uh, having those conversations where we talk with each other um, and we learn from each other, and once we know each other, because Daddy said, you know, men often fear each other because they hate, they hate each other because they fear each other, they fear each other because they don't know each other, they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other, and they don't communicate with each other because they are separ 
separated from each other. And so this brings us together to have it, to make the connection so that we can uh, explore together what can we do to change our community and not continue to let media divide us and define us. Um, we need to rise above all of that um, and discover each other because we're in this together. And unless we learn to live together, as Daddy said, as brothers and sisters, we're going to be forced to perish as fools. So we want to have these 1,000 conversations um, with people. We want them to join in um, and have these conversations. Now, should I say more how? By all means. <laughs> okay. I'm in no position so, to stop you. So the conversation <laughs> that you just saw um, with my brothers and sisters in Leadership Atlanta, and I want to thank those other members of Leadership Atlanta who are here tonight as well, um, are the kinds of conversations that we want people to have around dinner table, if you want to have coffee and desserts, it doesn't matter which way you choose to do it, mm. uh, but come out of your comfort zone and come together with a diverse mix of people um, and, and register at the King Center. We've partnered with Civic Dinners. Um, we want to have these 1,000 conversations over the next uh, year um, and something special will happen if you register um, soon, the, uh, one of those conversations out of the first 100 registrations, I will join uh, the person who was chosen um, okay. with our other partner, P&G. Um, Damon Jones will come with me and we will have that conversation um, with you. And, and if you go to belovedcommunitytalks.org, you can register there. Um, and we don't just want you to have the conversation, we want you to share the experience with us and we want you to do it more than one time. You know, that's not enough. There's right. persistence, there's consistency that's important. So hopefully those conversations will open people up to go further and go deeper and then begin to do something because conversation is not alone, that's lip service. Right. We got to pay life service to this process Indeed. undo systemic racism. And Professor, I'll close very quickly on this, on that, on that point. They have, you know, conversations that, you know, that aren't enough by, you know, by themselves, but we need to have, say, those conversations before, say, action can be taken, because I know certain people, I'm not accepting myself from this, push for action so, so fervently, but we're not necessarily pushing for understanding. Why is that so essential? Um, well, one of the things that I'm really grateful for, well, first, I'm happy that I could come here <laughs> on this amazing historic day with my sister here. I love her so much. I love her family. And a lot of people just did not realize that our families were close and that our mothers were very close. Yes, they were. Um, but one of the things that, were, that was very important in my household was this thing of self-love, mm -hmm. uh -huh. being clear on who you are, mm -hmm. not... Uh, uh, depending on others to define you. And so uh, for my mother, she made sure that our identity was intact, that we learned who we were as people of African ancestry, that we learned who we were as you know, women, the con significant contributions that we made to history mm -hmm. so that when I love me, then I love you. I see us as a reflection as, of one another. Okay. When you're in pain, I want to do something about it. Compassion, mm -hmm. care, all so important. Um, when I don't love me, I don't love you. That's right. mm -hmm. And so we can never, ever see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, that is, that, is, that is quite the point for us to end on. Unfortunately, we have to get going, but I want to first commend you both for continuing the work and upholding the legacies of your parents. Um, thank you. I want to I want to thank this take this time to thank you very much for joining us tonight and Antoine and um, um, Takeo and um, Dina and um, Jacqueline I want to thank all of you uh, for making this a, a night for people to remember because what's important is that we leave here and remember what was shared and that we begin to make it contagious that we even tell other people about signing up for these conversations yeah. Because if we don't understand systemic racism right. and its origins and its roots, we're going to continue to perpetuate it. And in fact, we're already perpetuating it in our technology systems. And that's why we have to disrupt what is happening right now. Indeed. Amen to that. Um, I want to uh, you know, say just again, your efforts are needed more than ever, as, you know, not just because of technology, but of course, uh, we have a number of other uh, tempests raging at the moment. Um, yes. 
And we just want to thank you all, um, including all of our guests that have been on the stage tonight for these conversations. And lastly, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank all of you here tonight. And I want to thank all of you watching online. And we uh, want to thank the Oprah Scholars, too, who were here yes. tonight as volunteers. Yes, indeed. The Oprah Winfrey Scholars from Morehouse College. Thank you very much. And the King Center staff and team. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for everyone who played a part in making this evening possible, including all of you watching online. We encourage you again to register to join these conversations, and we wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Courageous Conversations. The King Center and our partners at Civic Dinners invite you to join us in bridging the racial divide in our nation by hosting your own Courageous Conversation. Help us reach our goal of 1,000 conversations across the nation. To learn more, visit us on the web at belovedcommunitytalks.org. Visit us on the web at belovedcommunitytalks.org. Courageous Conversations. The King Center and our partners at Civic Dinners invite you to join us in bridging the racial divide in our nation by hosting your own Courageous Conversation. Help us reach our Thank you for joining Beloved Community Talks. We hope to learn more by the Courageous Conversation at the King Center and our partners at Invite you to join us in Rich and Rich and Pride in our nation by hosting your courageous conversation. Help us reach our goal of 1,000 conversations across the nation.